Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host today, Mitch Hewlin. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So today I'm very pleased to welcome our guest and my good friend, Dennis Furukawa of Mana Energy Partners. I probably destroyed the word Mana, Mana Energy Partners. We're going to be talking story today about sustainable energy infrastructure for low-income communities. And the objective is to reduce their cost of living by becoming 100% water and power independent. So Dennis is gonna tell us all about that. So Dennis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mitch, and uh, good to be here. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to have the first opening screen, slide one up there, because it shows a picture of Mill Village and what it was like almost 100 years ago. So maybe you could tell us about a little bit about Mill Village. Well, so Mill Camp was a, uh, a the company uh, housing for the Waialua Sugar Plantation, which was, I believe, the first and largest uh, sugar plantation operation on the North Shore. And uh, the homes that are depicted uh, on that cover um, are plantation homes, and I think that picture was taken in the 1920s. Uh, and that's a string of um, recently uh, built uh, plantation houses, uh, and so that's the vernacular that uh, that exists currently at the Mill Camp Village, and that's actually a style that we're going to try and, and, and preserve and, uh, and build on. Well, they're pretty nice looking houses, actually. Um, so I'm sure that they really enjoyed their houses. Of course, they don't like like that now. They're, they're over 100 years old. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they look at <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll be coming in with totally new construction and, um, and, and really 100% uh, new infrastructure and it's the infrastructure that's so i think compelling because it's all designed for sustainability so let's uh, flip to the next slide and uh, let's talk a little bit about an overview of what the project's all about i mean you gave us like the sixty thousand foot view but let's get a little bit more into the details my my objective in terms of uh the infrastructure and sustainability is um, it's really driven by the needs of the site in particular. So one of the one of the issues that we have is is that we're pretty close to the ocean um, right. on the north shore, and and uh, the the uh, the climate is perfect, obviously for solar, um, and we've got uh, a really nice fairly level ground to work with that's already dressed with streets and uh and um you know uh trees and and wonderful uh, uh a, a water system that's intact um, but the sewage system and the roads and the water uh all need upgrades to meet current standards um and of course uh, if anybody's ever taken any uh, drives out there the um the roads are particularly awful, so uh, we don't uh, we don't like to um, uh, uh, give the impression that we're going to be just dressing up the the site um, from scratch or, or or you know to to rebuild what's there. We're going to actually uh, start from scratch. So can we go to the the, the phase? Let's go to the next slide. So um, what we have is we've got uh, a, a, a series of new home sites that we're developing. Uh, and those total between 200 and 300 individual home sites in phases two and three. Yeah. Um, phase one is where we're starting. And phase one uh, is uh, is an entirely new, newly reconstructed area where we're going to be putting the current retirees who currently live at the mill camp. Um, and we're going to be putting them into 
new homes in phase one. Um, and once they're, they've been put into phase one, then uh, we're able to then uh, completely renovate the infrastructure uh, of the, you know, the original um, uh, home areas, which is are particularly in, in, in the phase two area. So in phase one, how many how many uh, uh, apartments or buildings are we talking about in phase one, Dennis? So in phase one, there are approximately um, eighty uh, uh, retirees. So those folks would be uh, are they are all old, um, uh, and it, it, it's uh, we're, we're going to be putting them into group housing that's like fully handicap accessible in 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 like four plexes so um the the uh the, the group housing itself uh would be um a, a limited portion and then we would be doing an additional number i think about eight another 80 units of uh, of like single family uh yeah. But group housing, uh, you know, in okay. well, more clustered, right? But but it is for it's it, it's intended for families, so it's not that's not exactly clear. But, uh, it's it's it, it it's all essentially the first phase would be to provide the the site for the sewage treatment plant, um, right. and the you know and uh, and and to provide a large amount of solar for the homes that are there. And um, uh, each group parking area would be an area where we're looking to put uh, a, a significant amount of solar on, um, uh, you know, on rooftop or, or on covered parking, but all of the home will be sort of maxed out uh, with, with PV. And and those will all be knit together to a micro. So let's move on to phase two, I guess. Yes. So phase phase two is uh, it really is a wonderful sustainable infrastructure. So uh, the the site itself is designed so that there is no runoff. Uh, of right. Water into the ocean, um, and there is no discharge of sewage into uh, septic systems or um, you know uh, it polluting the ocean. We we have to treat everything so that it can be reused on site and retained on site. So none of the water that's uh, potentially contaminated on uh, mill camp or by mill camp. Uh, all of that pollution needs to stay on them. Um, all of the storm water is, is intended to be absorbed into the land use of, of, of the area. So are you planning to have a wastewater treatment plant there for the for the village? Is that how yeah, that's going to work? if you go back to the phase one, it's a, it's a, it, you can see that there is a sewage treatment plant there. And the... Uh, the, the architecture that we're, we're doing would be to separate black water from the storm water um, okay. and treat, treat, the, treat the black water uh, uh, to a reuse standard of R1. And R1 is defined as waters that have essentially unrestricted reuse. Um, so what we'll be doing with the R1 water is irrigating uh, as much as we can on, on our site. And to the extent that the farmers that are in the surrounding lands uh, right. need water, we can offer them recycled water as well. Okay. So water is a big deal up there, I'm sure. Uh, right. I mean, uh, the, it, the, the issue is, isn't that we can't access water because this project came with its own water source. Right. You know, the, the issue is, is, is that you cannot get, you cannot allow that water to flow off the site. And, and there are no, right, 
uh, city sewage treatment plants to send the sewage to. So we have to build our own uh, wastewater recycling plant as part of the first phase, which is, you know, honestly, it's the responsible thing to do uh, because this is a substantial amount of density that we're that we're um, providing here. So these are five thousand square foot lots, and these lots are. Uh, you know, sites for a single family house. So I kind of go to the next slide. What you can see is uh, basically a, you know, a, on the left, you see a series of lots, right? There's a, a typical lot. Um, and each lot would have gray water gardens, which are irrigated from laundry uh, and um, uh, showers. So those would be, uh, uh, you know, really strong areas for growing uh, vegetables. Uh, um, not not necessarily all vegetables, but uh, papaya trees and um, and and flowers and uh, uh, corn and you know a num great number of, of of food crops can be grown too. So. Um, so that would help reduce their cost of living because they could be growing their own a lot of their own food. Absolutely, the 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 size of and the layout of the each lot is actually designed to really maximize the amount of usable yard, and that right. really goes hand in hand with the absorb the absorption rate of the storm water and the absorption rate of the right the treated wastewater that we've got to return to the site. But if you notice that in, in the, the back of the house lot, so towards the top of the page, you see bioswale storm water. Um, right. And so what what we have is the 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 truck is is on a paved portion of of the road, um, and right. then the shoulders are are pervious paved. Uh, the parking areas are pervious paving and and. Basically, so, what you, so what do you mean by pervious? It means that water can uh, the water can per, yes, the water can percolate through it. Okay, good. So, uh, and then we cap it with a solar carport, um, and each one of these homes we're targeting about uh, two kilowatts of solar on well, each, right. which is a, a substantial amount of solar relative to the energy load. House, because really, what we're what we're pushing towards is towards electric vehicle uh, loads being, you know, additional to the household loads. And so, right. in order to really provide for a sustainable community, we're really going to uh, need to uh, maximize the amount of power that we can generate. For so basically, own. you're going to be providing them with. Very low cost electricity. You're going right. to you're going to be uh, providing them with very low cost water. You're going to be helping them with their food supply, and you're also going to be helping them uh, by recharging their electric vehicle. Yes. So for transportation, so they've got it. You've got it pretty well covered for a low income uh, family. You know who uh, who you know those those costs are significant in their overall budget. It really helps them out a lot. It's a tremendous uh, savings uh, that because, uh, well, you know, um, once you put the solar in, uh, those uh, then the electricity is, is largely a fixed cost at that point. Okay, let's go to the, uh, uh, the uh, stormwater uh, management system and tell us a little bit more about that. Well, so, uh, you know, as I was saying, the the, the the roadways uh, are the uh, the high point of the site design, um, right. and and uh, the cross slope actually helps in terms of moving uh, the water uh, along the you know from the roadway down towards the bioswale. Um, right. And one of the things that is uh, is important here is is that. By elevating the homes, um, we don't run into a situation 
where uh, we're, we're confounded by accidental flooding because of you know, it, it, incredible storm water or, or rainwater events. Um, right. uh, and it, it allows the water to, to sheet flow down towards the, the bioswales, which then the bioswales are, are directed to, well, first their size to hold um, uh, the 50 year storm. And then right. there are some additional land that, that I didn't point out in the plan where um, there are additional rainwater detention uh, zones. But in general, the, uh, you know, it, it, as long as the, the site is landscaped, it's going to absorb water at a pretty high rate. And, and the soils that underlie everything are degraded corals, which have a high, high porosity. So this is going to keep stormwater from also from flowing into the ocean and screwing up the reefs and, and the, the water quality. And that's exactly what it's designed to do. Yes. Yeah. Great. Well, let's talk numbers. Let's talk a little bit more about the power that you're generating here on the next slide. A lot of, uh, a lot of why don't you just run us through uh, how this is going to work? All right. Well, so um, it, we're, we're, we estimate a total of 4.3 megawatts of wow. PV panels uh, aggregated over the, um, the, the homes and the, the carport roofs. Um, right. and, and for five hours of, you know, we, we average, I think, five and a half hours of sunshine on the North Shore there. Um, over the year, and so uh, that that'll produce about right 24 megawatts a day. Uh, 24, 24 megawatt hours. Hours a day. That's a lot. Uh, hours. It is a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. Um, uh, and uh, but right, one of the, our our big targets is actually to uh, provide power for electric vehicles, and right. uh, electric vehicles are energy pigs. So. But, which is why we're we're really you know right now trying to size up the uh, the amount of solar. So uh, we're we we're um, on on a daily basis. I think we'd be looking at uh, like a megawatt and uh, like one and a half megawatt hours or two mega megawatt hours just to um, run the basics of the homes. Right. Uh, uh, but we need additional power uh, to for those you know large energy spikes that happen during the you know the peak periods, and then we're also um, going to be using hydrogen uh, to absorb a lot of the uh, extra power that is generated during the day, um, which will be a ton of it. <laughs> we'll um, we'll use electrolyzers to turn that that power, whatever can't be stored in the batteries, okay. um, to be turned into hydrogen for long term. Okay. So I see here you're planning to have like at least 14 days of power reserve backed up by the hydrogen supply. Right. So the the objective here is, all right, well, um, you know, the seasons change and we get some extraordinary weather events. Um, we don't want to have a, a community that doesn't, uh, uh, you know, have enough reserve right. capacity that we're going to, you know, uh, need need emergency bails bailouts. Actually, you know, we want to actually have a substantial enough hydrogen reserve or energy reserve, um, wherein uh, we can help the community. Right. Uh, and right. So on that next. Point. We we do have to be connected to the grid. Uh, it's, okay, it's, I was going to ask that about that. Yes, it, it's a requirement um, by law that the that um, homes that can be connected to the grid, like uh, or, you know, are are connected. So um, uh, we um, will offer our uh, energy storage uh, resources. Um, to HECO through their new programs uh, of uh, you know, battery storage and, and uh, uh, 
I forgot the acronym, but the smart grid uh, right. programs. So uh, yeah, we we intend to to uh, work with Eco to improve grid quality for that whole uh, North Shore area by um, providing energy storage as well as uh, dispatchable power. Uh, and in oh. fact, we've already started making contact with, with ECO on, on uh, some of the, like the community solar. Right. Well, that'll be good for them too, because he can help manage their duck curve and other things that, they're work that they need to be managing. So uh, let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about one of my favorite uh, technologies, which was developed here in good old Hawaii by uh, uh, Paul Pontio and Blue Planet, which is called EMCC. Um, so basically, uh, let's go to that slide. And uh, they, they characterize it as the Swiss Army knife of te telemetry. But basically, it's a, it's a system, a command and control system, where you can monitor each house. So Dennis, I don't want to steal your thunder. So tell us how that's going to work. Is this, you're essentially setting up a microgrid here, and EMC is uh, tell, tell us what they're, it's going to do to help you. We're looking to um, uh, we're looking to use a variety of technologies as well as uh, technology providers uh, in order to provide both energy storage as well as dispatchable energy. Um, and uh, control the the uh, power quality uh, in our microgrid, uh, right? And and we're also putting in the capacity to um, you know to to aid uh, the the grid by using our our dispatchable power within our microgrid to to support the heco grid. Um, and the uh, amount of, uh, uh, or, or, or the, uh, the EMC square, uh, it, as I understand it, will allow us to add uh, uh, technologies in the future that uh, we can't anticipate currently. Right. So, uh, uh, we've been confronted with the option to go with packaging solutions but um, uh, that's not going to work for us because we're we're designing something for growth so right. uh, not just like a one-shot deal right and once again this is developed here in Hawaii and it's it's a real game changer and uh, we're gonna be hearing a lot more about this as we go forward as blue planet uh, expands so let's go to the next slide. It's a little bit of a wiring diagram. Why don't you work us uh, through your energy uh, microgrid here, uh, Dennis? Well, the idea here is that the um, HECO utility grid is on the right-hand side. Um, there's a microgrid controller next to the HECO grid tie, um, and that would be the EMCC, uh, <clears throat> right. as well as um, inverters. Uh, in that in that box, and then you can see that that each phase of the project um, uh, would would be a uh, a grouping of solar cells and batteries. Right. Uh, and um, so the the power that that the uh, that the uh, that the phase. PV and batteries generate goes through the controllers and and towards the load. Um, what's not shown in here is that uh, we um, and because it's so new uh, that we would be able to uh, feed power back into the HECO grid through the microgrid controller. But um, but let's just go back to the other part. So in each phase, the PV plus battery uh, array would be, um, uh, it, it, so let's just assume that the batteries get topped off, uh, then the power would need, so excess power would go through an electrolyzer uh, yeah. and, and which produces the hydrogen. And, and then up whenever we have uh, the need, like for instance, in evening times, uh, we would produce electricity for our loads, both by 
depleting energy stored in the batteries, as well as generating power through a fuel cell, uh, which would be consuming the hydrogen. So that's, that's the, that, and you can see that we have electric vehicle chargers uh, as, uh, you know, being part, being part of the, the loads. So let's talk a little bit more. We've, we've only got a few minutes left. So let's, uh, let's finish off talking about the electric vehicle chargers. I mean, this is a very cool technology. So tell us about this cool technology, Dennis. Well, it's, it's uh, I mean, it, it sounds all sexy. It's actually pretty straight ahead. I think that uh, a lot of homes already have uh, EV chargers uh, where you hooked up to their Tesla battery, um, uh, right there, wall packs. Um, uh, what we're talking about here, though, is uh, um, the, uh, the ability to use our stored hydrogen uh, to produce much more power than uh, we would be able to deliver in lithium cells. Um, uh, so by, by filling up large cylinders of hydrogen, uh, we can um, we can run fuel cells at a, at a, at a high output um, and charge several uh, you know uh, electric vehicles in rapid chargers. So what is I think that's level three chargers. So level three chargers, yeah, which yeah. are normally a huge yeah. demand on the grid, but this is a self-contained unit that's not connected to the grid at all. So you can really slam a charge back into a, into a, an electric vehicle, and and by using uh, stored hydrogen, it does not uh, require an infrastructure. If you, for instance, right. have that, that system on wheels, so one of the things that we're working on is to deploy uh, EV chargers uh, on wheels that are. Uh, developed uh, through this GM Empower uh, program. Um, right. And they... Uh, that's, they General Mo that's General Motors, so everybody knows. It's not just some little so grad shop. There's the, the company Renewable Innovations is engineering and deploying these systems uh, to utilize hydrogen uh, around the mainland. Uh, right. and, uh, and it allows it allows the development of uh, level three chargers in areas where uh, they're very far from the electrical grid. Or, or the grid is uh, just a can't hack it in that neighborhood because it's already overloaded. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, we're gonna have to wrap it up here, uh, Dennis. Uh, we've actually got breezed through our 30 minutes. So we're out of time, but I really appreciate you coming on and uh, presenting your wonderful project, and which should act as a model for us to really get after low income housing here in Hawaii, which we never seem to be able to get a handle on, but this project does. I mean, 300 homes is a lot of homes to be putting on the grid or, or to be uh, converting over to low income. And we, we, we handle food, energy, and water and transportation you know, for these low income families and really reduce their out of pocket expenses to make it totally livable. So it's a really, really awesome uh, project. So th thanks for sharing this great project with us, Dennis. And uh, I wanna thank our, our viewers for tuning in. So I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another great show on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.